Um, thanks a lot. Um, thanks to the organizers for this uh, organizing this uh, nice workshop and uh, giving me the opportunity to present um, my work here on algebraic structures in tensorial field theories. So we uh, switch a bit uh, the topic again and basically continue at a point where Karen Yeats yesterday left us, uh, namely um, about um, Dyson Schumann equations with the algebraic structure. And um, I will uh, start the talk by um, uh, yeah, telling you uh, the most important thing is about tensor theories, because I think this is uh, what's, uh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> you all know about the algebraic, uh, in principle about algebraic structures, but uh, what tensor field theory is, is uh, probably a bit special. So quite in general, tensor theories um, generalize random matrices to higher ranks, to tensors. And um, this comes with a generalization of uh, theories of random surfaces to uh, theories of random geometry built from uh, higher dimensional triangulations. In fact, in uh, what's called tensor models, um, there was a big breakthrough uh, that one can have an expansion in the size of the tensors. And uh, one finds that this is, uh, uh, generalizes uh, the expansion labeled by the genus of surfaces to, um, to another expansion in, uh, in a degree uh, invented by Hans van Goro. And then you um, find that um, at the leading order in this expansion, one finds something physicists call branch polymers and which most probably is the continuous random tree from a mathematical perspective. And in subleading regimes, uh, you find uh, more structure, which you find um, something like the Brownian map and multi-critical structure. So this is interesting random geometry. Um, now, if you uh, have really a field theory of such uh, tensors, um, then it becomes interesting because the, this uh, genus or your degree expansion relates to uh, the renormalization group flow. And to pick up uh, some motivation of an earlier talk on Rion QFT in this workshop, what's interesting here is that uh, such a theory might actually be tractable in the sense of uh, maybe solvable or even integrable at the leading order. And then from this uh, RG perspective, this DUV regime, but might have, uh, most probably has some richer structure um, beyond that regime. So it, yeah, it might have both, <laughs> both interesting parts that uh, we can understand really something with it because we can solve it to some extent, but it still has a non-trivial uh, quantum field theory structure. So this is an interesting motivation from a purely QFT perspective. But then also because it's theories of random geometries, there are also models which are proposals for a theory of quantum gravity, which mostly come on under the name of group field theories. So there's also a, a very interesting physical uh, motivation to study such theories. So the ultimate goal thus in these applications would be to, to find random geometry or even quantum geometry um, at criticality. So, <clears throat> it's not enough to, uh, uh, to consider these field theories perturbatively, but we really have to push to the non-perturbative regime. And there are very various possibilities to, uh, to try this. So um, we have joined in some work um, building on the functional renormalization group approach, which is uh, an approximative scheme. And uh, there are hints for Wilson uh, Fisher type fixed points and further new fixed points. And uh, there's also a clear relation to, to vector theories. So this is interesting, but it's uh, approximative in the end. So um, one can use Dyson Schwinger equations. One can use them directly in their functional form, which uh, is what worked very well for the um, matrix field theory case, the course of Wolkenhaar model. But here I want to um, uh, consider, <clears throat> uh, want to try, uh, try to understand this regime from a uh, more uh, based on the algebraic uh, structure. And uh, I want to push towards uh, the combinatorial Dyson Schumann equations Karen talked about yesterday. And uh, there is a good reason to think that this might work well because the leading order diagrammatics of these tender theories, they, they have tree structures. And then in the subleading regimes, there, there comes more. So 
you would think that um, you get at least in this leading order regime tractable Dyson Schwinger equations, which you can understand well and relate to what's already known in conventional Dyson Schwinger equations, and then extend to, uh, to other interesting regimes. So, <clears throat> how to get there? Um, actually, first of all, <laughs> we have to under really understand the, the uh, renormalization Hopf algebra um, of such field theories. And that is generalize them from local Q of T to tensorial field theory. And I will show how you can do this even more general. So tensorial field theories are a speci specific kind of field theories um, with non-local interactions. Um, then you need uh, a map which evaluates the diagrams. Um, and uh, I will give you sh show you how this works in the case of the UVH momentum scheme. Then, uh, if you have all the structure, then the Dyson Schwinger equations uh, follow, uh, can be stated by uh, the Hochschild one co cycles, these B plus operators. Um, uh, I will show you how I, this, this basically follows directly, and then you can use <laughs> the, the aim is to, to use this to, um, to find solutions. So let me briefly uh, give you some more uh, details on. What actually these field theories are. Um, and uh, let me start with uh, uh, reminding how perturbative field theory works. So in perturbative field theory, you usually have some covariance, so some propagator, which gives a Gaussian measure, and then uh, your correlation functions um, are given as, as uh, moments with a, with a weight of some interaction of, in this measure. So this interaction in local field theory uh, means really that there's point-like interactions and they can be expanded in, uh, in momenta like this. So what's the structure here? Point-like interactions, you have a certain kind of momenta uh, of fields and all these momenta are convoluted by um, direct distribution of the sum of them. So the structure is like this of a vertex and actually if you look at it, there's not much much more structure than just a vertex in a graph. So what happens when you do a perturbative expansion? So you expand this exponential of the uh, interactions. Um, you get a form of power series over graphs because you recontract such vertices um, along the fields along these half edges. <clears throat> in combinatorial and non-local field theory, everything is the same. Only the interactions are now combinatorial and non-local. What does that mean? So now we have a field which lives on R copies. Um, and um, you convolute not uh, all the momenta, but you convolute um, the momenta pairwise. So if you uh, diagrammatic pick what's happening here, um, so you have the fields and their momenta, but now there are here three copies and you convolute <coughs> uh, the momenta pairwise with the momenta of some other field. So this structure, um, uh, you see that the, the structure of such interaction is basically given um, by a graph. So the combinatorics of the interactions are now vertex graphs, not just the number of, of the fields in the interaction. And if you do perturbation theory, this leads to uh, something called uh, rank two ribbon graphs or more generally stranded uh, diagrams. And uh, to make all the algebraic structure yet precise, I introduce uh, a new definition for these objects, uh, uh, which is quite general, which I told, call two graphs. Though I've learned in the meantime that I've overlooked that um, 50 years ago or something in combinatorics, there was already the notion of two graph introduced in a completely different context. So probably maybe one should better call them strand graphs or something. But here I will stick to the notion of two graph, to the uh, word of two graph. So what happens uh, if you now big contract, um, big contract such interactions? Um, and you uh, do, uh, in the recontraction, these momenta are, are paired along the edges, and um, you get something. Uh, you get such such loops, such lines of uh, of momenta. Um, these are the ones called strands, then typically, and uh, sometimes also faces. Um, and um, so you can uh, perturbatively expand your correlation functions um, now as a sum over such uh, two graphs. And um, 
have um, they, they have uh, the amplitudes then are integrals over the strand momenta uh, and the usual propagators. So the, the rules how you get uh, how you get the the amplitudes is uh, as always you you get couplings from the interactions you get propagators but the new thing is now um, these momenta are identified along strands or faces and not just loops. And then you have the usual problem that integrals might not converge in a, in a given theory, so you need formalization. Um, and uh, you need some forest formula, which can be described by the kramer hoff algebra uh, in local field theory. But you need some principle of locality there for it. So it's a bit confusing. Now you have non-local theory with this work. So the main result here is that uh, the Hoff algebra of Feynman graphs um, indeed generalizes to two graphs for combinatorial non-local field theory. And uh, the trick is that the notion of locality for needed for organization, local field theory, this actually general, generalized to this notion of vertex graphs here, which already in specific cases was also coined moiality or traciality. So this gives then a clear and concise algorithm actually to apply the forest formula and to simply calculate renormalized amplitudes. For example, maybe PHZ momentum screen. And it opens up the possibility for all kinds of hop algebra based methods. But here, my motivation is in particular conventional Dyson chain equations. So, I now already gave you the motivation both about tensor field theories and uh, um, explained to you a bit what combinatorial non locality is. And the rest of the talk, um, I will first um, uh, present you some details on uh, structure of the two graphs, how you contract them, and then what algebraic structures follow from this. And then in a um, Second or third part uh, talk about the renormalization. So, uh, what defines renormalizable field theories? Then there, how to compute and uh, the combinatorial dice equations. So, <clears throat> let me give you some definitions for uh, to have a bit more um, <laughs> precise understanding of uh, what these two graphs are. So, one graph. Um, for, for the half algebra, a nice uh, convenient definition of, of graphs, actually the half, half edge graph um, uh, prescription, where you have a set of vertices and a set of half edges which are adjacent to them. Um, and then edges are just involutions of the half edges. And uh, if you can know about um, strand graphs, now uh, two graphs had a, a second layer, which is why <laughs> I called them two graphs. Um, Further, you have now a um, set of strand sections, and these strand sections are adjacent to the half edges. And at a vertex, they are uh, paired now. And then for the edges, you have to, um, to pair to involute the strands along the edges. And uh, for all these involutions, you could really well uh, consider sets describing these edges and strands. So then um, this important notion of vertex graph <clears throat> directly follows um, that on a given vertex, you can, from these definitions, directly define this, this notion of vertex graph. So basically, the, the structure of stranding at a vertex. And in principle, you could uh, present you, you could start with a notion of two graphs just in terms of the vertex graph, you might think. Um, just give these involutions defining the edges plus such a set of vertex graphs. But actually, you have to be careful because if you just consider the, uh, uh, the union of all the vertex graphs, uh, you might lose the uh, information which of these vertex graphs really belongs to vertex because it could be that these are uh, not connected. So if you really want a, uh, yeah, an equivalent description of, of the two graphs in terms of vertex graphs, you, you need a, a set of, uh, of graphs, which could be, uh, uh, so you, you have to consider these disconnected graphs as a set of graphs. So this then gives you a projection. Um, and now let me give you an example. Um, uh, how, how, how this works in, in practice. So in these tensorial field theories I want to talk about, or which are the main motivation for all this, um, the Feynman diagrams in the literature are regular edge colored graphs. 
um, and the the meaning uh, of these of this graph now in, in this in this language of two graphs is so you, you have here a, a, an edge colored graphs with um, r plus one colors and the the zero the zero colored edges are uh, depicted as dashed lines so these are to be understood as the actual edges of the two graph and uh, all other um, all other uh, colors of edges uh, give you the vertex graphs. And then the stranding, how you connect the, the strands along an edge uh, in such a graph is simply given by uh, preserving the color. So you can only uh, um, connect the strand of color C1 with then a, a strand of color C1 here. So this is not directly bijected exactly because uh, of this reason of the disconnected boundary graphs you could have. Um, so in fact, this kind of representation is, is not as universal as, as this one. So if you really want to do everything in a clean way, you need this notion of two graphs actually. And the, uh, then the connection to random geometry is that uh, such R plus one color graphs, they're actually equivalent to other dimensional pseudo manifolds in the sense of uh, abstract simplicial complexes with manifold properties. All right, so um, now I'll explain you how to contract um, uh, two graphs. So subgraph is simply, um, subgraph of a two graph <coughs> is simply one which has a subset of edges. So let's look at this example. Uh, so this, this is now a two graph. So there are four possibilities <laughs> to have uh, less edges. And contraction means to shrink all the edges in this subgraph of the subgraph in the origin graph. So let me explain you this um, best with the, the example again. So if you in this in this graph you um, <clears throat> you contract um, just the graph without edges, you do nothing. So you just get the graph back. Sorry. Um, but if you, there's now a subgraph with one edge and you shrink this edge herein, what happens is that um, you delete these, these vertices and you have to connect the strands through this edge directly. So for example, this triple of strands is connected to this triple of strands, which gives you here this triple of strands and the same way here below. And then you already see the interesting thing, what, what happens if you have uh, two graph structures that um, depending on how these strands are paired along the edges, you can get completely different things. So if, the, uh, if uh, this uh, special color here uh, is the same, you get uh, uh, such a, such a um, two graph, but if the color is different, then um, uh, if, I, if I contract this, this edge here, um, this strand is connected with this and this one with one of those triples and what you get is you only connect two of the of the triples together and the other another way and then there's also um, one very important thing if you contract the, the full uh, two graph in itself depending on the color structure you might uh, get uh, connected or even uh, disconnected bundle graphs so here is a uh, if these colors are different here then um, you get an example of uh, a vertex with a disconnected um, vertex graph. So this is very important. Um, in the end, we're interested in, uh, in unlabeled graphs, so equivalence classes of relabeling. So under, under this, uh, such uh, diagrams would be the same. Um, and uh, what's important for the, for the Hopf algebra is um, the, the residue structure. So residues are those uh, two, um, graphs or two graphs here without any edges. And um, the, the residue of, of a diagram is simply its contraction with itself. So this is the external structure of a diagram. And the skeleton is uh, just the vertex structure of, of the graph. So it's the one without any edges. And the interesting thing is this is actually basically the notion of boundary in these in these geometries, um, um, because <clears throat> uh, if you if you take furthermore the the vertex graph of uh, of the residue, this this 
can be used to define the the boundary of uh, um, um, yeah of the of the geometry, and um, <clears throat> this in fact is equivalent to to how you define the uh, boundary of these pseudo manifolds. Um, but for field theory and for renormalization, you again have to be careful. Um, you don't want uh, only to, uh, to you don't want to um, compare uh, manifolds with the same boundary, but you also want to keep the information which part of the boundary belonged to which vertex in the beginning. So you again have to, uh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> so an example here is, is uh, would be such a two graph. If I now take the boundary here, it's just four of these uh, uh, four green lines. And, uh, and on the boundary, you wouldn't see any more if uh, one belongs to this part or that part. But this is important for renormalization. So <clears throat> the, uh, yeah, you can define a, uh, adapted notion of, of boundary, which um, takes into account this fact. All right. So then um, coming now to the algebraic structures from this. So this actually goes along the lines you all know uh, from the usual, uh, how, you, how you define the concrima of algebra. Um, <clears throat> you generate um, an algebra by a set of of graphs, so now we take all two graphs. Which this defines as a Q algebra uh, with, a, with the usual multiplication of union, and um, <clears throat> you can have the co-product, which is simply the sum over subgraphs um, tensor the contraction of the, of the subgraph. So you, as usually, get a co-algebra, in fact, a B algebra, and this works as I said, all completely parallel to one graphs. So as an example here, take this example. Um, um, I, uh, yeah, I, I contract I contract the, uh, the skeleton. Uh, I contract a uh, graph with one edge. I get, uh, get this uh, interesting, <clears throat> interesting contraction here. And uh, I contract the graph itself, so I get the, uh, the residue. Um, and then, so now I have defined uh, the very general um, algebra of, <clears throat> of any two graphs, but you can restrict it down as long as you uh, um, are careful with the contraction closure. So as long as um, and graphs, um, the set, the set of your, your two graphs, uh, K, um, you close it under a certain other set of graphs, usually the two graph itself. Um, um, then, then everything works fine. So why is this interesting? Because typically we be interested only in a, in a set of uh, graphs with a special type of vertices. Um, and then this is a sub by algebra only if I take the uh, contraction closure of, uh, of such a subset and then the span of. So for field theory, this is the, um, the important uh, important algebra then the, it's a theory space so if you for example start with one type of interaction the question is what kind of um, interaction interactions are generated so you might have to include uh, lots of other interactions simply because they <clears throat> appear when you contract something but the the good thing is if you have this example of matrix of tender field theories which are characterized by a certain number of strands um, um, so the tensor rank, then um, this, uh, with respect to the rank, this uh, uh, set of uh, graphs is already contracted, uh, contraction closed. So you directly get a, a sub-algebra of um, <clears throat> two graphs of a rank R theory. Um, and now uh, what one needs to, to, to renormalize amplitudes is actually uh, um, the important thing is that you have algebra homomorphisms evaluating the, the amplitudes and uh, you need this con uh, usual convolution product. And with respect to that, um, you find that there is a co-inverse also here. And importantly, this gives you a group structure on these amplitude maps, the algebra homomorphisms. And uh, also with respect to this structure, <clears throat> 
the, the theory space, so the um, subalgebra uh, for specific vertices is a subalgebra. All right. So this is the algebraic structure, and now um, let's let's go what you do uh, with that uh, with field theory. So for renormalizability, I um, first take the purely combinatorial point of view, what a field theory is, uh, which is that theory is just a number of uh, edge types and vertex types and weights of them and the dimension. So on each edge and vertex type, you, you give a weight. And um, then as I already mentioned, the, the Feynman diagrams of such a theory are given by all the two graphs <clears throat> are built from these vertices. And this already generates your Hopf algebra. And then the important thing is that you have to figure out what actually are the divergent um, two graphs. And now this is, um, as usual, given by these scaling weights of your vertices and uh, the scaling of the propagator. Plus, um, from the integrals, now you have um, dimension times the number of faces uh, contributing to the to the um, super, uh, superficial divergence degree, uh, in contrast to the number of loops in local field theories. And then the theory is renormalizable um, if this divergence degree depends only on the boundary. Plus, actually, here you might have some uh, modification. Um, but which has to be um, has to be compatible with the with the contraction then, and then you can uh, define this set of divergent one pi diagrams, and the uh, usual concrima type of algebra of romanization is the one of divergent two graphs of the theory. All right, so what does that mean uh, in a given example? So tensorial field theories are characterized by an, uh, an order of interaction, a dimension, and the rank. And they're actually um, similar to dimension times rank minus one dimensional local field theories in the following sense. You have to um, weight scale the interactions of the r colored graphs uh, with a weight um, dr minus dr minus two zeta over two of the order of the interaction, which is the number of vertices in the vertex graph. Um, and uh, okay, the Feynman diagrams are bijective to, to these up, up plus one color graphs, as I already uh, told you in an uh, uh, earlier example. And the divergence degree of these theories um, is then um, given by, by this part. So uh, basically the, the, the scaling of the uh, boundary vertex type of your diagram, which is the same as in local theory. Um, and DR, DR dimensions, but then comes some um, extra part um, um, given by the number of connected components here. And here in uh, rank two theories, matrix theories, here would be the, um, the genus, but in tensorial theories, this generalizes um, in terms of the Corot degree, which is a sum over certain kinds of generalization of Hegel surfaces of uh, the topologies here. Um, and uh, this delta is to be called the reduced degree and simply because it's the uh, <coughs> properly normalized um, quantity in this formula. Um, okay, so uh, the theories are renormalizable as, as usual as uh, um, for local field theories up to an order which is uh, given by this first part. And then the important yeah, that's all. Uh, and as an example, just renormalizable quartic theories would be those which have this uh, dr dimension being four or four zeta if you allow <coughs> different propagator scalings. So this means um, if you have a, a linear propagator, this would, for example, be um, a matrix field theory in two dimensions or um, rank three um, tensor theory in one end. Uh, and the important point for normalizability now is that, um, I mean, in this formula, everything depends on the boundary, but this uh, reduced Corot degree 
And the important proof is done by Rasaka and Tanasa in, in 2013 is that coproduct preserves um, coproduct preserves this um, this extra effect. So uh, still the the algebra <coughs> closes, and uh, you you see in fact that you can indeed have renormalizability. Um, uh, there can be diagrams which need normalization even with a um, non-vanishing um, degree. And also there can be in principle diagrams with uh, more connected components. So uh, <laughs> the first uh, example of uh, such tensor field theory, which is a sextic rank four theory, uh, that, that actually needs uh, non-connected verdicts in its definition and has uh, correlation functions with this uh, external structure to be renormalized. All right, let me um, very briefly uh, tell you how to compute then with this structure. So um, just repeating the, the map which ev uh, evaluates you, your diagrams, gives you an amplitude. Then in the VPH that momentum scheme, you, um, uh, you have a subtraction operator given simply by tail expansion um, of the order of the uh, divergence degree. Um, and then primitive divergent uh, two graphs, so those with no subdivergence, you simply uh, renormalize by <coughs> subtracting um, this tail expansion. So, how, how does it look? Um, just uh, giving you an example. So, this would be the tadpole in a matrix theory, and you subtract and get some function with a log. And uh, to give you a flavor of how tensorial theories then uh, are different. Um, so as long as, <clears throat> uh, um, as I have here, just a, just a number of, of strands, they behave here, the variables Q2 and Q3, they effectively behave like one higher dimensional variable. So the result for such a tadpole would be exactly the same um, as, for the matrix theory up to a factor. But then in tensorial theories, you might have different combinatorics, different diagrams, you get new amplitudes here. And um, <clears throat> for the subdivergences, uh, due to GPHZ, you know that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, if, um, uh, if the superficial degree of divergence is uh, larger or equal to zero, then there always exists a counter term such that um, the renormalized amplitude converges and uh, explicitly you use the similar forest formula and this is exactly where what's what's described by the half algebraic structure and uh, crucially uses um, this inverse of the group structure the antipode in the, in the definition so uh, you can use it as yeah. So the point here is that this counter term works in the same way also for combinatorial non-local field theories as for local theories. Um, and can use it to, to calculate. Uh, right. So uh, <clears throat> the first non-trivial, uh, really non-trivial example in, in matrix theory would be the sun, uh, sunrise two graph. Um, you can calculate everything through and find some <clears throat> uh, some result with the uh, multiple poly logarithms. And the, what I would just want to say here is that uh, indeed, if you apply this machinery, you find the same um, results as already computed by Alexander Hock um, for for this matrix theory. Um, and again, to give you a flavor, how this works uh, for higher rank. Um, the point is basically that uh, here in this example, there's uh, the, the divergence is, is, is less severe. And actually there, there are less divergent subgraphs, which in this case already trivializes a bit. So there are no overlapping divergences and you get a factorizing amplitude. Um, so actually um, you see that the, uh, you find a more restricted set of uh, um, of diagrams in tensorial theories compared to, to matrix theory, but there is a richer, uh, uh, it's, it's richer in, 
in all the combinatorial uh, possibilities. And an interesting question actually at this point now uh, is what uh, one could proceed with, what's actually the, the class of amplitude functions you get in tensor theories more in general. So um, this, <coughs> uh, yeah. this opens up um, uh, to fold this question. Um, now let me finish with uh, some remarks on combinatorial Dyson-Schmidt equations. So actually this is pretty much work in progress. So I just want to highlight you some features. So um, as you've seen yesterday, now <coughs> spelled out for, for these um, two graphs, the combinatorial Green's functions, um, you can expand in, uh, in the number of faces. So that's the equivalent to the number of loops. Um, so and uh, get then the, these coefficients in this loop expansion. And um, the combinatorial Dyson Schmidt equations make use of uh, um, this B plus operator. Actually, you can um, uh, use the, the usual definition known from local field theory again, with a, which uh, needs certain combinatorial factors, which take uh, into account the, um, all the symmetries, basically, uh, of how you can insert uh, diagrams in other diagrams. And uh, you can simply state derive this combinatorial Dyson Schmidt equation. So we have uh, we've done this for the relevant examples, but uh, uh, I would also like to, to really have the general proof for this very general setting of combinatorial and local interactions here. And um, if we got now go to an example of, of tensor field theories, now let's look here at a rank five um, quartic theory. Um, which is interesting because it's really the combinatorial, combinatorially simplest just renormalizable theory. It just has a uh, divergence degree four minus uh, the order of the interaction minus this usual um, degree part. And um, uh, you can see from, from this formula that only melodic diagrams, which uh, are defined by having degree zero and only one, con um, one boundary component, only those need renormalization. That's because you can prove that uh, this degree is always bigger or equal the rank minus two. <clears throat> this way, uh, why the, the rank five theory is, is more interesting, uh, is simpler than the, the rank three theory I considered before. And if you have this, that only melodic diagrams um, appear in the, in the uh, top algebra of the organization, you can actually uh, make use of a, of a Map to planar trees, which is uh, was introduced and used uh, uh, from perspective of an intermediate field representation or loop vertex expansion. So I've depicted this here. So if you have, if you have these quartic interactions and you um, project <laughs> project such an interaction simply to a, to a line labeled by the color of the interaction, you end up uh, with such diagrams, and now you you see that you always have such such loops of edges and these you can contract to points and you you only have to um to then to to respect the order uh, of the of these interactions interaction edges around such a vertex and then you have a bijective structure so um this uh, simple case of uh, of quartic rank 5 theory has a renormalization of algebra which is actually one simply of colored planar trees. So this makes you uh, positive about uh, um, that you could handle it. But there's uh, important differences to, to tree of algebras uh, you're familiar with. So this here is uh, not, a, not the one of decorated trees, you know, from field theory. So, but it's, uh, it's the edges which are colored here. And actually the two point graphs are, are, are rooted trees. So here the root are simply omitted. But in the four point graphs here are, are, the, uh, are ones with two markings. So with the two roots, so the same. And um, this uh, results in the following features of, uh, of tensor field theories. Uh, here in this simple example, the, the other very simple thing is that only the tadpole and the fish diagram are primitive. So the tadpole would in this prescription be this one and the fish this one. 
Um, so this means also that uh, you have only a finite number of terms in, in your Dyson-Schmidt equation. This is good if you want to do something with it. And then there's this very special thing that uh, only connected boundaries appear in the in the top algebra. So this is exact, exactly the the example of before. It's uh, you can only have um, you can only have diagrams where um, where the color of of the uh, of the interactions here <coughs> uh, are the same. So you have always in the, in the four point function you have always a chain of the same color. Um, um, between the two markings, between the boundary, um, because otherwise you get uh, more uh, connected components on the boundary. And um, then there's also one thing which might be overlooked, but I think is very crucial, is that um, because of this color structure, the, the two-point function actually is directly a sum over all colors, while the four-point function is actually labeled by a color. So this uh, each four-point function for each color um, has not such a sum in it. And this results in, uh, in some uh, special uh, properties. So the, for example, the co-product at, at order loop order k, phase order k, does actually not factor as you used to uh, in, in, in tensors um, <clears throat> of um, uh, coefficients uh, of loop order adding up to that loop order. And this is because <clears throat> you have um, we have this overall sum over C here. And um, another point is that different you have different combinatorial factors, um, whether the adjacent interactions are the same or not. So if you, for example, look at this uh, two loop, uh, two point diagram here, um, if the color B and the color C are the same, then um, you actually have as a subgraph uh, this fish graph, but if they are not, you do not have it. And uh, this makes it very special. And um, actually, um, Adrian Tanasa uh, with, uh, with others looked at this already in uh, 13 for matrix theory and 15 uh, for such a tensor theory. And they, this, they, they took a brute force solution to simplify this. And they, again, just included this broken four-point function, this four-point function with uh, more boundary components. So then everything is basically again the same as in local field theory, but uh, I think this is a bit problematic if you really want to consider this field theory because this gives you a different half algebra. It's not the realization of the theory. So I think this uh, this should really be seen as a feature of these uh, tensor field theories, and uh, should be understood better. And um, uh, what I'm working on is um, to improve the understanding of these special features by including the water entities, which lead to certain hot yields, which I think is crucial. So with, the, yeah. with this short discussion uh, on, <clears throat> on, on the status here of the common paradise equations, I want to conclude. So what I showed you is uh, how the algebraic structure of randomization generalizes to any combinatorial and local field theory. And uh, I wanted to highlight that uh, this gives you a, a nice algorithm to explicitly calculate actually amplitudes. It might be interesting to look a bit more into these function spaces then. Um, but what interests me in particular here is um, that the random geometries and quantum gravity occur at, uh, in the non-perturbative regime. And um, this has to be understood. And we try with the conventional Dyson-Schmidt equations. And actually, the first step is to identify this for the matrix field theory because the nice thing is in matrix field theory, we already know lots of uh, um, explicit, explicit solutions. So it would be nice to understand these solutions from this algebraic uh, perspective. And so this is work with Alexander Hawk and progress and then generalize to tensors of higher rank where I already, uh, yeah, where I showed you today some aspects of it. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, and uh, for this very interesting talk. And so we jump to the discussion with uh, Alexander Hawk. Yes, yeah, I'm here. So if I'm allowed to share my screen, I can start. Johannes, can you unshare? Yeah. Um...
So it's here. Where? Okay. So can you see the my slides? Yes. Yes. Okay, and can you hear me? Okay, good, very good. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much, Johannes, for your talk. Uh, for me personally, this is very interesting, a very interesting topic that you found the Hopf algebra for these two graphs. And um, so I will say, first of all, a little bit about what is actually known in in ordinary quantum field theory. So, I mean, most of the audience maybe know it much better than I do. So there's this Hopf algebraic structure by Conan Kreimer found this renormalization Hopf algebra in quantum field theory. And we have also heard on the conference uh, talk about combinatorial dyson springer equations coming from this Hopf algebra with this B operator, this insertion operator, grafting operator. Uh, which was used by Broadhorst, Clymer, Yeats, and a lot of other people. And from these combinatorial Dyson-Schwinger equations, we have learned also now by, I think on the second day, by the work of Borinsky and Dune and other people, um, that you will get non-perturbative things. So with this resurgence and so on. So this was a little bit what we can get from the Hopf algebra for quantum field theory. Then what is new by Johannes Thuring? What did he? He actually defined this two graphs, which is a very general graph. Uh, these two graphs appear in matrix models, tensor models, and a lot of other models is very general, um, but it's much more complicated. So the definition, you have seen the definition, maybe not everybody could understand the definition because it was also very fast, but the Examples were very good. And from the examples, you can have an image how, how these two graphs looks. And one example are matrix models and then the tensor models. So these two graphs can have additional colors, additional strands. And the most important thing is that the vertices itself are graphs. So this makes everything much more complicated that the vertex is a graph and also the boundary structure. So the external legs has also graph structure. So we have vertex structures and boundary structures, which are given by graphs. And this is much more complicated. For matrix models, it's essentially, essentially quite trivial, the boundary graphs. And for matrix models, we have, uh, for example, the Konsevich model, which is a very interesting example. Um, for two graphs, which is more or less the most easiest example, I would say, than the grosse wolkenham model. And also from Hermitian matrix models, we have this relation to two-dimensional quantum gravity, what also Johannes mentioned, and all kinds of tensor models, where I'm not an expert, are also examples of two graphs. And then what, in my eyes, the big theorem of Johannes is that actually these two graphs have an underlying Hopf algebra. So, so there's this Hopf algebra, this renormalization Hopf algebra. And uh, for this to prove, for Johannes, it was uh, important, he mentioned it, but maybe I should emphasize this a second time that he need to define this contraction closer, which gives you the right subalgebra. And this is a very important, quite technical thing. Um, but it makes it much more different to some previous result. So previously, there was also the construction of um, the Hopf algebra by Kleimer and Tanasa. It was, I think, in 2013. Johannes mentioned it as well. For the grosse wolkenhaar model, which is a matrix model, phi to the four. And they also um, create, uh, they also um, uh, construct the Hopf algebra but they did it differently because um, this boundary structure, which was so important in Johannes talk by this contraction closer and so on, was done differently by Kleimer and Tanasa. So, and they somehow rescued themselves 
by some artificial subtraction by higher boundary graphs. And actually we have seen in the talk of Johannes that his definition of this contraction closer and the subalgebra he's looking at is a very natural one because it extends directly to any other two graph and not only for the Grosse Wolkenhaar model as it was done by Kleiman and Tanasa, but it is an extension to any two graphs, to any, any tensor model and to any matrix model. And also he mentioned this insertion operator, which also have to take care of this boundary structure of this boundary graphs. So this is very, in a very essential thing. Um, um, yeah, in the theorem of uh, Johannes, which is actually not so easy to understand just here in 40 minutes. And you have to look at a lot of examples to really understand that. So, and then he also said there's an application of course, by renormalization of algebras, which is the BPIJ theorem. So the forest formula for renormalization, which uh, is automatically um, valid by the antipode, the antipode and the convolution. This gives you as usual, the forest formula for two graphs. And this is a very easy way to formulate it for all kinds of matrix field theories, for all kinds of tensor field theories where we have this example of matrix field theory, phi to the three, matrix phi to the four theory. And he mentioned uh, the phi to the four. No, it was actually another one he mentioned, but also in this uh, theory. And uh, what, what maybe now the very interesting thing is for me personally, in this models in phi to the three and phi to the four matrix models, we have computed exact results so we have this one side where we have, of course, after some genus expansion, we have exact results and the perturbation theory. And the perturbation theory now with the Hopf algebraic picture. So we have uh, these two different versions now and we can compare them. So we have the exact results, let's say for genus zero, and we have the renormalization by Hopf algebra. So, and now we can compare it. And actually what happens in these two models for matrix models is that the exact results are given by topological recursion where we have heard this talk by Alba. So also these two examples here are an instance of topological recursion. And now by Johannes work, we also know that there's an underlying Hopf algebraic structure. So, and then is maybe the question, we know that there are also Hopf algebraic structures for tensor models. Is there also topological recursion for tensor models? This is not really known in general. I mean, there's one example by uh, Stefan Datois where they have a tensor model which satisfies topological recursion, but in general, it's completely not known. And, uh, yeah, now maybe last comment on this perturbative, non-perturbative uh, interplay. So our work in progress with Johannes uh, gives us two different ways which can be compared. So on the one hand side, we have this Hopf algebra. We can get combinatorial Dyson Schwinger equations and then hopefully similar to the work of uh, Michael Borinsky and Gerald Dune, maybe resurgence. Maybe we can end up, this is somehow the goal. Maybe look if there's something like resurgence. And on the other hand, we do different calculation. We do our usual calculation. Johannes called it functional Dyson Schwinger equation. So these are the usual Dyson Schwinger equations, you know, not coming from Hopf algebra. We do a large n limit or a formal um, n limit uh, genus expansion, and we can get exact results with topological recursion. And there's this genus expansion actually, which is also not convergence, not conversion, and can maybe a kind of resump by or as a trans series um, expansion. And there's also some kinds of resurgence in the genus expansion. So we have these two different ways and some of our work in progress is to understand them and then compare them and how this Hopf algebra and this other genus expansion with this functional Dyson Schwinger equation, what is the difference? What are the relations between them? And are we able to somehow go from one way to the other? And 
Yes, maybe if we understand it here properly in this example for matrix models, maybe we can also can say something more in ordinary quantum field theory, but this, this is far future because we want to learn something about exact results. And then maybe we can forget some of this addition, additional structure by um, the matrix models or by these two graphs to get back to ordinary quantum field theories. Um, but this is something uh, which we uh, have to be very careful about. Okay. Uh, this is my discussion and I actually had during the talk much more other questions and I prepared only one question. If actually Johannes is aware of uh, a model uh, in tensor, a tensor model where also exact results are known and if they are compared with the BPHZ theorem to his Hopf algebraic um, yeah, renormalization, if he knows some tensor model where it is also the same and uh, it worked out. Yeah, thank you very much.